Okay, so our topic today is pest control strategies for turf. Um, so if you've been following our Lunch and Lung series, everyone should have a very nice uh, lawn by now, especially the cool season grasses. They seem to be doing really well, in, at least in my neighborhoods. Um, but as the summer heats up, uh, there's all kinds of things that are going to want to take over your yard. And we're here to try to help you minimize their effect. So um, there's uh, many pests that will take over um, the garden and your lawn, and these include insects, um, weeds, diseases, uh, which include the fungal and bacterial diseases, and animals. Um, and today we're just going to focus mainly on insects. Um, and these are going to include grubs, which feed um, under your turf, and chinch bugs and sod webworms, cutworms, which feed above ground. And then we're going to briefly discuss mosquitoes, ticks, and cicadas, which don't really affect your yard, but they're in your yard, and we want to help you control them to some extent. So um, master gardeners like to uh, approach any kind of pest management with, um, it's called an integrated pest management approach. And this is the use of multiple um, tactics to, to suppress pests and avoid outbreaks. And we wanna keep, we, we, our goal isn't really to eliminate all bugs um, or all weeds. It's to keep them at a minimum and to keep them off balance so they don't take over your yard. Um, and we want to not use a whole lot of pesticides when possible um, because you can build resistance to them and there's a lot of other effects that they can produce on the environment. So um, what we want to do is just keep everything um, keep your, your plants strong and um, you want to outgrow the weeds and you want to out you you want to make it uncomfortable for the pests to uh, populate your yard. So the first thing with integrated pest management is um, you want to assess the site conditions, which I'm going to talk about in, uh, in a little bit. But um, and, the, and the second thing is to survey and ID your pests. And you really you want to do this over a period of time. Um, you want to walk your yard routinely, what's out there, how many are there out there. If you don't know what the bugs are, um, feel free to send it into the extension agent. They can help you um, ID them and determine whether you need to take action. Um, and you want to determine the pest response threshold levels, which, like, how many are there? Is there are you at risk of this taking over your yard? Um, and it really depends on what your aesthetics are. Do you want a perfectly green yard, or are you okay with some weeds and some little brown patches? Um, and you know, do you have lots of kids running around? Do you have dogs? Um, or other pets that you know are going to mess up the yard, um, but you're okay with that. So um, uh, then you ideally you want to keep good records on your yard, map out where you're seeing some issues, um, and keep an eye on them. So you, when you walk the yard in a couple weeks, you, you can tell what's what's gotten worse and what's kind of keeping down the bug level. So and then you want to make a decision from all that information. So um, on site condition, um, you wanna look at your yard and determine the amount of shade. Um, and this is huge. Um, this will determine what kind of seed you wanna use, or even if you wanna plant grass. Um, if you have a ton of shade, you're, you're always gonna be fighting to get that grass to grow. So you might just wanna think about maybe a ground cover or something else. Um, that's easier to take care of. Uh, soil fertility is important. You want to do your soil testing um, every three years. Um, those are, are available at various places. You can pick them up at the um, plant clinics, at the farmer's markets that we're starting, um, and you, they're also available at the libraries. Um, 
you also want to look at the density of the ornamental plantings around your yard. And this will control air movement um, and humidity. And certain diseases um, take over when there's a lot of humidity. So it may be that you, if you consistently have fungal diseases near these bushes, you might want to pick a different type of grass or do something else that will help that area. Um, you also want to look at soil compaction. Um, it, it may be that you need to aerate in the fall um, and if, you're, if there's a lot of compaction of the soil. Um, drainage is important. If you have a consistently wet area, then you're going to want to um, either fix the drainage to that area or plant something else that likes wet feet all the time. Um, and it's really important to know where you are with streams and ponds. Uh, this will, this is very important. There's a lot of um, insecticides that are toxic to aquatic creatures, you know, your frogs and fish and um, toads and stuff like that. They, they can't tolerate a lot of these uh, pesticides. So if your yard is draining into a creek area, be conscious of what you're spraying. Um, and then you also have to think about your current mowing and watering and fertilization practices. Um, it, it's key to keep your grass longer than you probably want to keep it, but this will help block out your weeds. Um, there's a lot of bugs that will live in taller grass that will take care of your pests, pest problems. Um, underwatering during drought periods can lead to a lot of die off too. Um, and it stresses the lawn, especially the cool season grasses. And you, you need to be careful how you fertilize because over fertilization can lead to an increase in insects too. So um, you take this all into account and try to get the best lawn and the strongest lawn to minimize your susceptibility to insects. So, okay. So your cultural control is um, choosing the plants that are adapted to the growing condition. And uh, unfortunately in this area, we don't have a great grass for us. We're in a transition zone. So we're gonna be fighting whether you have cool season grasses or, or warm season grasses, none of them are perfect. So it's gonna be a battle all the time, but uh, try to put the, try to pick the right grass seeds for the right place. Um, and for instance, bluegrass does not like shade. So you're gonna to wanna to use a fescue or something else in that spot um, or again, a ground cover. Um, so, and then uh, apply your appropriate water and fertilizer. And then again, your strong plants resist diseases. So, um, and, your, and weeds, and especially don't mow too short and sharpen your blades on your mower. So, so they don't um, shred the top of the grass and make them more susceptible to diseases. Okay. Um, so when you decide that your lawn is overwhelmed by insects, you, you have to look at uh, different treatments and the effectiveness of the treatment. Is it worth the cost? Is it worth the possible side effects? Um, you know, is it going to damage your turf, run off to streams? Certain insecticides can kill birds, um, and certain insecticides can cause, you kill off certain bugs, you might end up with more bugs of a different type. Um, so just be careful what you, you choose. Read your labels of your insecticides very carefully so you know that they're actually um, going to get the pest that you're after. So make sure you identify your pest. So. And remember some insects, a lot of insects are beneficial. So um, you don't want to kill those off too. So, so we talked about a couple of different um, insects that are, uh, that can affect your yard. And we're going to be talking about the uh, Japanese beetle a little bit later. This is kind of a um, overall on grubs. Um, so, Grubs are really the larval form of several species of beetles. Um, the, the green June beetle, the Japanese beetle, the May beetle. And you can actually tell the difference by the pattern on the raster, which is their butt. They have a different pattern of little 
spiky things that stick up, um, which may be important uh, if you're actually going to treat them because you need to know what your, your, what kind of beetle you're treating because not all of the insecticides um, or treatments treat all of the beetles. So um, you, just because you see a grub, it's not necessarily a Japanese beetle. Um, so the, there, you've been, I've been seeing them when I dig in my yard, there are these C-shaped soft white larvae um, in loose soil. And these aren't really much of a problem this time of year. Um, it's usually when they hatch out and lay eggs and then those larvae start to cause injury to the lawn in the late summer and early fall when the lawn is already stressed and it will look even more stressed um, it will look like it's yellow and drought stressed in these big irregular patches. And the soil will be spongy and you can actually pull the, the grass away and you'll see a, a whole bunch of, of uh, grubs underneath your um, grass when you do that. And also the, the lawn um, may look like creatures are digging in it because they are, because they like to eat them. So the fox and the raccoons my dogs like them, so um, they're always in the garden looking for them, so. All right, so I guess you need to determine whether the grub treatment is necessary. So you, you want to dig um, an area of your um, lawn up and count the grubs, um, and if there's more than six to ten grubs per square foot, then you want to consider treatment. And then, again, look at the grub butt to determine what kind of grub you have and therefore what kind of treatment is required. Um, and this will be about midsummer that you want to do this if you're having a problem. So, um, and next slide. There's several biological treatments. Uh, the Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT, you can um, spray this onto your yard and it doesn't harm um, the uh, other animal population. And it's actually pretty safe um, for um, like frogs and those type of things. Um, you can also use this as a dunk. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later in, in ponds and other things too. So that one's actually pretty safe. There's also a Bacillus papillae, which is a milky spore bacteria, and it works on certain species, but not all of them. Again, you gotta look at the, the butt of the, the grub. Um, there's also Bavaria bassania, which is an insect uh, pathogenic um, and fu a, a fungus, um, and that, that will kill certain species too. And there's also nematodes that you can apply to the yard that will actually attack the grubs. Mm -hmm. um, if all else fails and you're being taken over, then you can use a chemical treatment. Um, and that includes carbaryl, imidacloprid, and trichlorphan. Again, read the label, make sure it actually uh, will get the type of beetle that you're trying to get rid of and um, follow the label to the letter. So, um, oh, also um, turf aeration will kill up to 40% of grubs. So when in doubt, aerate your yard. Um, okay, and then chinch bugs, these attack blades of grass above the soil um, the adults will lay their eggs in the grass, in the folds of the grass. And it's actually pretty hard to find them if you um, don't know what you're looking for, but um, the nymphs will suck the grass blades and kill the grass. Um, and you, um, you actually see these little, the adult bugs walking around on the sidewalks and up your house if you have a big infestation. Um, and you can stick a uh, coffee can, like a big coffee can with the two sides taken out, stick it like a couple inches down into the, your turf and pour um, like a soapy water in it and wait a few minutes and um, the bugs will float to the top. And if you see more than 15 to 20 immature bugs, um, then you probably need to treat. 
Um, so your cultural control, um, you, you want to avoid fine fescue grasses and your heavy spring fertilizers. Um, you can actually get a fescue that has endophyte in it, and you look for the seed that contains endophyte, and this has a fungus that will reduce the uh, chance of you getting this type of bug. So um, read your grass seed labels carefully when you buy them. Don't just buy the giant bag at uh, Costco. It might not be the best thing for your yard. Um, your biological control for this would be the Bavaria bassania, which is the um, fungus. And then your chemical control is um, a permethrin spray, carbaryl or imidacloprid. Um, if the, the slightly damaged turf will recover if you lightly fertilize it. If you, if you fertilize it heavily, then you end up with even bigger problems. Um, and the, the problem with chinch bugs too is it occurs when the crabgrass is kind of taken over your yard. So you might end up with a, a giant mess with the chinch bugs destroying your yard and then the crabgrass coming in and taking over everything else. So um, just be careful with your fertilization and uh, your management of your, of your yard. So. Okay, the, the next creature are sod webworms. Um, and these are most noticeable on short turps. They feed above ground on the leaves and stems. Um, and you see them mostly in mid to late summer. You can have two generations hatch out in your yard. Um, the adult is kind of a nondescript brown, gray moth. And you'll see them hovering above the ground. Um, they don't really do much. They live on dew, um, but they lay the eggs that causes this. So um, a drench test can help you find this. And the drench test is um, you take a, a gallon of water with a couple tablespoons of soap, dish soap. You pour it over a yard of your ground. And if you get a bunch of um, uh, the, the, larvae will float to the surface. And if you see um, many of these, and you might want to think about uh, treating. However, these do pupate and um, turn into moths. So you don't necessarily need to do anything unless you're having a huge outbreak of it. Um, they do make a, they like line their um, little hole in the ground with a web. So you might see the webbing on your grass um, and wonder what it is. And, and, and if, if you look closely that it, you'll see the, the, a little hole where the caterpillar lives. So and these you can, be, can treat with endomopathic nematodes. Okay. So mosquitoes don't really um, affect your yard at all. Um, but they're annoying and they can pass diseases to humans and pets. Um, they prefer areas where water collects and is not moving. So if you have a pond, um, get, the, get a little bubbler in it. Um, and uh, the, the adults will lay eggs next to or into the water. And they don't need much, just like a tablespoon of water um, will, you can get mosquitoes. So um, you want to eliminate all sources of standing water. Um, but the, the larvae will pupate in a week um, and then you have the whole cycle again. So weekly, go around your yard, dump your um, the bottoms of pots, um, check your bird baths, clean them out weekly, check your gutters, um, anything where water can stand and, and cause a problem or where these things can grow, um, you need to check them every week. Um, your, your biological control, the BT dunks that you can get, um, they're, a little, they're a little round things. You can break them up and put them in the bottom of your pots. Um, you can also put them into your fish ponds, um, or if you have rain barrels, you can 
put them in there. They're not harmful to the tadpoles or fish or your frogs. So um, you see a lot of uh, mosquito spraying companies. It's very expensive. Um, they have to come in routinely to spray. Um, they say that it's a, a uh, flower-based, chrysanthemum-based um, ingredient, but it's not really. They're actually synthetic pyrethroids and um, they can be harmful to your bees and your pollinators and the fish and aquatic invertebrates. So, um, and also some of them will use organophosphates, which are toxic to birds and animals. So think twice about using some of these companies. Um, the ticks are not harmful to the lawn either, but the warming climate is increasing the numbers and the range of the ticks. Um, we see the American dog tick in this area, the Lone Star tick, um, the deer tick, and there's also a new tick called the Asian longhorn tick which can actually replicate without mating. Um, and it kills the, it mostly wild, the livestock or wildlife by causing anemia. Um, they can increase their numbers so quickly. So um, that's the bad news. Um, and these ticks can pass diseases such as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Lyme, Ehrlichia, Anaplasmosis, and Alpha-Gal, which is the alpha gal is passed by the um, Lone Star Tick, and it can actually make you allergic um, to red meat, uh, beef and lamb, and possibly pork if you get bitten by a Lone Star Tick. Um, it, you break out in a rash, uh, it can make you nauseous. So if, if you do find a tick on yourself, pull it slowly, grab it by, um, the body, pull it slowly until it releases its mouth pieces, and then wash your wound and stick that tick in a little vial with alcohol. If you happen to get a rash um, or any symptoms, you can take that tick into the doctor and they can determine whether it's carrying a certain um, bacteria or, or uh, virus or something like that. So. Um, don't torture the tick. If you put a match on it or alcohol or anything that irritates the tick, they actually regurgitate the mouth parts into you. So you actually have a higher risk of getting the disease if you torture the tick before you pull it out. So just, just pull it out. Okay. So the ticks like to hang out in the tall grass um, and when you brush by, they will grab a hold of you. So you, you want to get rid of your tall grasses and dense vegetation by mowing frequently and get rid of the brush that will, um, around the, your house, that will decrease the numbers of the ticks. If you have kids and you want play sets, then put them in the sunny locations because they don't really like the direct sunlight. Um, move your wood piles away from the house. If you're out in the woods, stay in the center of the trails, wear light colored clothes, tuck your pants into your socks. Um, and do tick checks frequently um, and shower after being outdoors so you can rinse them off with you. Um, and these are listed, the DEET, of course, picaridin, oil of lemon, eucalyptus, um, uh, bio, I can't read that. <laughs> and there's a, the other two um, that you can use to keep them off of you. Um, and especially if you have pets, especially dogs, uh, make sure they're on some sort of flea and tick control um, because they love to bring them into you and that's how you can get them too. So. And then we, we have to talk about cicadas. They don't really affect your yard except they might be um, emerging from tunnels. So I have a lot of little holes all over my yard um, and they're starting to emerge around Right now, I saw my first ones uh, a couple days ago. So um, they usually emerge when the soil eight inches down is 64 degrees, and um, they emerge in huge numbers to overwhelm predators. So the adult cicadas are active above ground for eight weeks, and it's the males who are singing to the females. Uh, so when they start making all that noise, it's the males. 
Um, a, a week after they emerge, they mate, and the female has an ovipositor, which is a little spiky thing on her rear end that she will um, stick into uh, the ends of twigs that they have. They're smaller than a half an inch in diameter, so it's it's usually the the ends of trees that you'll see this, or especially some of the younger trees. Um, and then the eggs hatch and the larvae drop to the ground and they burrow down into the ground and are gone for another 17 years. So they don't cause really much problem. They're, they're gonna be kind of cool, so enjoy them. <laughs> okay. That's it, these are my references. Thank you, Leslie. I think perhaps we should have a welcome cicada party. Uh, we were talking with Leslie and all of these references she's, she mentioned are very, very important. So remember this is being recorded and these references will be available for you to see later, uh, but they're all very, very good references. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tanya is ready to put those mock strawberries in their place. Tanya? Thanks, Elizabeth. So that's pretty interesting information there, Leslie. I'll be checking out the, my lawn for a couple more pests when we finish here today. I'm happy that I get to talk to you about this beautiful, troublesome little weed that I grow like a professional, the mock strawberry or Duchesnia indica. Really cool name for a troublesome little plant. The mock strawberry grows in all levels of sunlight from full sun to almost full shade. It can be evergreen, is a perennial, and definitely can create a dense, low-lying ground cover as shown in this image, taken after my husband mowed our lawn just last week. It definitely adapts to your mowing level. The fruits are eaten by some birds, and while we consider it to be an aggressive, weedy, broadleaf plant on, in our turf grass around here, it might actually be considered as invasive in some parts of the United States. The flowers are yellow. That becomes key here in a second. They occur on long stalks emerging from the point where the stem meets with a set of three leaves. The yellow flowers have five petals with large leafy sepals beneath them as shown in the picture. If you want to catch this plant when it first emerges, which I suggest you do whenever possible, those first leaves that come from the soil are a bit thicker than the ones you normally see on the plant and they have hairs along the margin only. The first two or three leaves are simple. The rest are trifoliate or in sets of three. Stolons emerge by the time the fifth leaf emerges and then this plant is off and spreading through your turf. This plant spreads by seed and runners for a double whammy. The red fruits face up and have a similar familiar shape and color to a, the strawberry you can buy in the store, but they are actually pretty tasteless. The leaves are as shown in this image. They range greatly in size, depending on the location, the sun exposure, and the soil conditions of your plant. But they are all ovate to elliptic, hairy, and have rounded teeth. The leaf stems or petioles are also hairy. I emphasize yellow in the blooms that I talked about on the previous slides to help you um, for one reason, that mock strawberries are different from wild strawberries. Many people think the names are interchangeable, but they're simply not true. The wild strawberries or Frigeria virginia are similar in appearance, but they have white blooms, pointed teeth on the leaves, and a lower density of ground cover as you can see in these pictures. The fruit also tends to hang down like a regular strawberry or lay on the ground next to the plant rather than face up, upward like it does in the mock strawberry. And we'll talk more about this in a second, but both are edible. So if you taste one and it's basically flavorless, that's a mock strawberry. If it tastes like a strawberry should, well, you've got a wild strawberry on your hand and feel free to daydream of how you'll be using those in your summer meals while I get ready to talk about how to get rid of the other kind, the mock strawberries. We are gonna always tell you here at Lunch and Lawn to strive for a thick, vigorous lawn as your best defense against all pests, weedy or otherwise. You can improve the surface drainage, Enjoy the cicadas while they aerate your lawn this year and water as infrequently as you can to maintain healthy turf, but not water your weeds. Mechanical removal, fancy way to say hand pulling, and mulch will be your best friend in the flower beds. But if it's taken hold of your turf, you'll have to rake up the big mats like I have in my lawn. 
and be persistent and relentless. If that doesn't work for you, it might be time to consider some chemical controls. Since mock strawberry is considered to be a broadleaf weed, we can treat it with a post-emergent treatment. Three suggested treatments are listed on this slide for you. The 2,4-D, the dicamba, and the MCPP-P. Look for products that contain one or more of those chemicals, then check the label to make sure that the product treats the weed. Apply it as directed on the product label. You might wanna consider treating small areas of your lawn at a time, but whatever you do, read all the label directions and follow them to the letter. The label is the law. And if your mock strawberry is out of control and you don't want chemicals in your lawn, take heart because you can use the mock strawberry for a lot of things. The fruit does contain sugar, protein, and vitamin C. So toss a few in your smoothie along with other fruits. They're tasteless, so they're not gonna affect your taste there. The entire plant is medicinal. It can be used as an anticoagulant, an antiseptic, a fever reducer, and even a skin, skin ailment treatment. It may be flavorless, but it's helpful. So check out the Bellarmine University link in my resources for a full list and ways to use it if you're like me and are better at joining it than beating it. Thank you much. Top notch, Tanya, thank you so much. It's very surprising to hear how helpful weeds can be. Sheila, please tell us about those Japanese beetles. Oh, and that reminds me. Um, why did the uh, Japanese beetle larvae morph into an adult? Because it was tired of being grubby. Okay, <laughs> time for <laughs> Sheila. <laughs> of course it was. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Tanya, who knew that there was a difference between wild and mock strawberries and that they were both actually edible? I didn't. Thanks for the awesome presentation. So Karen shared some good information on the Japanese beetle, but I'll give you a little more as the Japanese beetle is the pest that we will be talking about today. The Latin name for the Japanese beetle is Papalia japonica. The order is Coleoptera and the family is Scarabidii. Take a look at this pretty bug. Pretty invasive, pretty destructive, and pretty much one of the most damaging insect pests of both turf grasses and landscape plants. Notice the colors and the markings on its body. It was first discovered in Southern New Jersey in 1916. It seems to thrive in areas with moderate temperatures, precipitation, and having large areas of turf and pasture grasses. They have steadily expanded their range north to Ontario, south to Georgia and Alabama, and west to Missouri and Arkansas. Adult Japanese beetles are about 7 16th of an inch long. You see their size here compared to that of a penny. Japanese beetles must have all these physical characteristics. They have a metallic green colored head and thorax with five patches of white hair on either side of their abdomen and two patches on the tip of their abdomen. Their wing covers are coppery brown in color. They do not quite cover the tip of the abdomen. You can see antennae that are clubbed at the end and they may spread to a fan-like form. They have six legs like all beetles that are from one eighth to one inch long with sharp spiny feet to help ward off predators. This next slide uh, illustrates the life cycle of the Japanese beetle. As you can see, they are underground for most of their life. Let's start by looking at the middle of the picture at the adult beetle, which emerges from the ground in late June, early July. The adult feeds, mates, and the female drops to the ground, burrows down a few inches and lays her eggs. This is repeated several times. She can lay as many as 60 eggs. In about two weeks, the creamy white colored grubs hatch. They continue to feed mostly on grass roots and they mature. By about November, as the ground cools, the grubs dig deeper for the winter. In April, they have moved up, have finished feeding, and pupate in preparation for emerging from the ground where the cycle repeats itself. When beetles begin feeding, the leaves are damaged and an odor is emitted. 
that attracts many, many more Japanese beetles. This picture is an example of what Japanese beetle damage looks like. They feed on the leaf tissue, leaving the leaf veins intact. They are also attracted to fruits and vegetables, especially those ready for picking and eating. I had some Japanese beetles last summer on my tender baby green beans. Flowers are not off limit either. Here you see a rose being decimated. Grubs are busy causing damage also. Remember we said that they feed primarily on grass roots and they do so while the grass is actively growing, which is for several months. When there are a large number of grubs, grass can be permanently damaged by reducing the grass's ability to take up water and nutrients through the roots and then to be able to withstand the stress of a hot, dry summer. Healthy turf can tolerate up to 10 grubs feeding per square foot. Additional turf damage can occur when animals dig for grubs. So we recommend that you strive to maintain a healthy lawn to withstand grub damage. Here's a picture of what the turf damage looks like. You could actually roll back the damaged turf because it has lost its anchor. So what is a homeowner to do? We don't recommend the use of Japanese beetle traps. Why? Because while they do attract beetles, just as many beetles, even more than usual, will visit preferred plants that are in the vicinity of the trap, resulting in much more damage. So we have some suggestions for you. First, there are cultural controls. Beetlejuice, anyone? The first thing we recommend is that you check your plants for beetles. If you see them, impact can be limited by shaking them into a bucket of soapy water. Highly valued or new plants can be protected by covering with a fine netting during peak beetle activity. Healthy mature plants can withstand a lot of feeding without significant long-term damage. And lastly, if beetles are a problem for you, when adding or replacing plants, select plants that Japanese beetles do not like. The reference of the University of Minnesota and the University of Kentucky, which are on the reference slide, have suggestions of plants not usually damaged by Japanese beetles. Next, there are some biological controls. A newer product to control grubs when they are small is the strain of the bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is sold as grub gone. Bacillus thuringiensis is also sold as beetle gone. It is derived from soil bacteria and is also moderately effective against adults, giving about two weeks protection. In addition, it is not toxic to bees, which is important because we want to protect our pollinators. Milky spore, Panabacillus papillae, is a bacterium that produces milky disease. It's intended to infect at least some of the grubs and reduce survival and reproduction, but probably less effective than the Bacillus thuringiensis. Finally, let's take a look at chemical controls. There are insecticides that can be used for Japanese beetle grub control. Imidacloprid, sold as merit, is effective on contact and via stomach action. It is effective over an extended period, but needs to be timed just before or while the eggs are hatching, which would be mid-June, early July. Bear, advanced lawn and garden multi-insect killer, a pyrethroid product, can provide one to two weeks of plant foliage protection. Special care must be taken when spraying. Avoid times when pollinators are on the plant. And as always, read all label directions and follow directions to the letter. Make sure that the pest you want to treat is listed on the label. If the plant happens to be an edible, observe the number of days between pesticide application and harvest. Remember, the label is the law. And lastly, a list of references that I used are on the last slide. Thank you, Sheila. It's true. They are so beautiful, but what they can do 
just isn't pretty unless you use the word awful after pretty. It's pretty awful. <laughs>